If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Horse welfare and safety are of utmost importance where humans have any interaction with horses. Within the courses at International Horse College, we only utilise methods that promote safe and humane ways of interaction between horses and humans. We only support safe methods of educating riders, handlers and trainers about horse welfare. Internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Today, our guest again is Annika Overton. Now, Annika came and talked to us on episode 199. So if you'd like to hear a little bit more about Annika, what drives her, what sort of keeps her going, what her background is, just go to episode 199 and then come back to this one. But today, Annika, how are you going today? I'm fantastic. Thank you, Gwyneth. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. Oh, look, love to have you on. Always happy to have you back, and especially when someone that's as popular as you. But today we're going to talk about 10 tips of engaging the child rider. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Now, why this subject? Why this one when you've got millions of other subjects to do? You know, what drives you to choose this subject? (laughs) Yeah, there were so many things I could do, but... I do find that uh, there are a lot of parents and certain pony club instructors as well, but um, the parents are often quite involved with the children and they might go away to uh, professional coaches once a week or once a month. Um, Often the ones that are there with the kids a lot of the time and what we really want to do is to try and help uh, those parents and certainly some of the parents that teach pony club that may not teach a lot otherwise to get a bit of an idea of how they can really help connect with their riders, how they can try and actually um, have them enjoy the experience, understand that it's okay to make mistakes and develop some skills around really connecting with the riders that they have and and just generally making it a really fun, growth learning experience. Yeah, yeah, because it really is a specialty area. You know, someone could be teaching at a very high level, but just not connect with children at all and would like to. So I think if they listen to this chat with you, I'm sure that they could learn quite a lot, even beginner coaches starting off and people that just feel that they need to connect a little bit more with children. The first one we've got about engaging the child rider is to let the child know that mistakes are markers of growth. Absolutely, no question. And that's one thing I do find that's quite common is that Little people are quite nervous of making mistakes. They see it as almost the end game that they've done something really wrong. Um, they they really get quite worried about it. And often if they're so worried about it, they, they tend to not want to try at all. Mm-hmm. And what I really want to help them understand is that we can't avoid making mistakes. Yes. Because whenever we want to go forward and try something new, mistakes are inevitable and they're going to happen. But what we make them mean and how we move forward from those are what's really, really important. Mm, mm. Yeah, I'm thinking of the little kids, you know, wanting to make a mistake. And the other thing is, too, that particularly when you're first teaching them, you're a stranger to them and that you might have been built up a bit. Oh, there's a new instructor coming and you're going to get lessons off this new instructor and they're really good and they're, <laughs> they're trying to impress you. They don't want to make a mistake. No, that's so true. And I really do right at the start of any session, really let them know that this is in a supportive environment. I'm entirely here for you. Mm-hmm. But I do say, look, make all the mistakes in the world because my job is to is to find those holes and, and to really get into the nitty-gritty and, and look at all the bits where we can really help. And, and I want to find them, and, and we get excited when we find something that they're not sure of or when they make a mistake. I'm like, yes, great. You're about <laughs> to learn something fantastic. We're going to do something yes. really cool. Wait yes. for this. It's going to be yes. awesome. And yep. 
and it, I make it so the mistakes are, are fun and I really acknowledge them and validate them for them. And, and because one of the things is we don't necessarily want them to make mistakes in competition. Mm. Certainly when you're competing at a high level, you want to get to the point where you don't make mistakes, but you want to be able to make them in training. So you're actually cognitively understanding the process that needs to happen to get it right. So when you're at a competition, you've gone, I know I don't do ABC, <laughs> um, and you, you're so much more ahead of the ball game because you've made all those mistakes and you're just, you're able to really focus on what needs to happen to get it right. Yep. So I really, really look to, to find those things where I can let them know, cool, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now the next one, and we get this with little kids, you know, they're, they're scared. There's lots of reasons why they could be scared, but they're scared. And again, yeah. you're the instructor, they're trying to not be scared, but what do you do if they're scared? Well, to be quite honest, I really validate their fear. Mm-hmm. I let them know that it's entirely okay to be scared. And again, it's a little bit like the um, the concept of you need to make mistakes in order to grow. Unless we're pushing ourselves somewhere a little bit fearful, we're not going anywhere at all we're either getting better or we're getting worse. And if we don't move at all because of of getting of being fearful, then we you know we certainly are getting worse. Mm-hmm. One thing I really, really love doing with with kids that are quite fearful, and often they're not willing to acknowledge that they're fearful. And that's one really important thing is I really like kids to to feel quite vulnerable and and say, be okay with actually being fearful and acknowledging that because even saying, saying it to themselves and acknowledging it and breathing through it, often that actually goes. But I use a little game sometimes with kids uh, if they are a little fearful and I want them to say to me, whenever, you know, we're doing something and they get scared, I want them to yell it out to me, I'm getting a little bit scared now. (laughs) And whenever they do it, we laugh and I champion them for that. And then I really let them know that every time you're a little, you're getting scared, you're actually pushing yourself somewhere, so you're actually getting braver. Mm-hmm. So then we actually change the language to "I'm getting a little bit brave now," and <laughs> that in itself changes how they feel about it. And the other thing that they need to, well, I love them to, to understand is that we don't actually get courage until after we've done what scares us. Uh-huh. So they need to acknowledge that they're fearful, yes, and then really sort of work out, well, why is this important to me? Why do I want to be able to to trot up to the scary part of the paddock or to um, pop into canter or to to do whatever that may be? We'll talk about, well, why is this important to you? And then we have so much fun around going, well, it's okay to be a little bit scared to get you, but once you've done it, that's when the courage comes. You can't wait for the courage yes. because it won't happen. You've got to do it anyway, and then you feel more courageous to try something new. Mm, mm, mm. And and I love your use of words, you know, going from I'm, I'm getting a bit scared now to I'm getting a bit braver now. Good use of words and good use of changes there and really to encourage them to know that, that that's what they're doing. And I also like to let them know that mm. – um, like we all get scared. Sometimes yes. they have this idea that they're the only ones that yes. are scared and that yes. everyone else is big and brave and they're out doing it. And I'll often talk about um, mistakes that I've made or times that I've been scared or you know conversations I've had with role models or some of my mentors when they've been scared and how they've gone through and they've done that anyway, just to let them know that they're not the only one that is scared, but the difference between those that end up going going further and doing better mm-hmm. are those that when they feel scared continue on and those that don't. And then give them that choice to say, well, you, you can, you're can. you still going, you know, we can't make fear go away and we don't want to, but we can decide what we're going to do about it when it shows up. Perfect. Perfect. What about the core drivers? You know, what drives the kids? Because different kids are going to have different drivers. How do you separate them and find out and have exercises that are appropriate for them? Yeah, I I actually personally really enjoy this aspect. Certainly when I've got three or four groups, uh, three or four riders, sorry, in a clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, But through the conversation that you're having with them, you'll notice certain language and certain questions that they ask you and things that they do. You'll get to know whether they're driven towards adventure, whether they're driven towards you know, a challenge, whether they're driven towards 
wanting certainty or variety or whether they're wanting connection and compassion and growth or completion. And getting to understand, for example, if you've got one rider that, you know, their driver is, they want the challenge and they, they want that adventure, and then you've got a, another rider with you who likes the certainty and they like the outcome, I will change that language to suit those riders as we go. So mm-hmm. one might, if, if it's an exercise of a series of fences or so forth, I'll say to one, all right, now your challenge is, yes, and we'll, okay. we'll sort of word it around how we're going to create the challenge in it, whereas the other one we might talk about, all right, in order for your horse to feel to feel safe when he gets the other end and to feel confident, this is how we're going to go through this exercise to develop your horse's you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, confidence and so forth. Or some, I'll, if they're really driven by outcome and completion, I'll let them know what the outcome of that exercise is. What's the purpose of it? What's, they want to know the point. They want to know the end game. Yep. Others aren't so worried about the end game, so they don't necessarily need to know what it's leading to, but we might talk about the, the connection that they'll have with the horse and, and how it's going to develop um a better rapport, and it's going to de- develop that compassion that your horse that you might have with your horse, and and the growth in it. So, yep. the better I can get to know what drives them, I can play with that, and I can really use that to to make them more willing to want to try some of those exercises. Good, good. Now I'm just thinking we're using all the senses, you know. So, do you want to talk about that? You know, we're talking about transitions, aids, but using all the senses. Yeah, absolutely. And this also comes back down to the language that I'm using when I'm uh, teaching the writers. So, for example, um, I've got a seven-step process that I use when I'm teaching the writers to understand their rising diagonal. Yep. And the steps go from being able to, to hear the, the front foot hitting the ground, listening for that beat and saying, now, now, so that they're, they're really mm-hmm. listening to that. Then I will let them look down and actually see that outside front foot hitting the ground. And then we'll also talk about feeling it. And I won't go through the whole seven steps, but um, as we're going through, what can you hear? What can you feel? What does it look like? And by chunking it down, but using all those senses, they're able to put it all together. And once they can go, okay, the foot's hitting the ground, that's when I say now, that's when I feel that I need to be sitting. And they actually start to develop that understanding around it and they remember it so much better. But it doesn't matter what exercise I'm I'm doing with them. I'm often saying, all right, what can you feel right now? Or what can you see? And really... And you'll find that the riders actually use their own language, and that's how you can tend to know whether they're kinesthetic learners or auditory learners because of the language that they'll use to you. Yes. And then you can actually use that language back to them so they can start to 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 have a better connection with you because you're already on the same page as to how, that, how they learn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. The next one, we've got the right and the wrong options. You know, it's it's very black and white, isn't it? This is the correct way. This is the wrong way. How do you do that? Or, or you know, give us a little bit more information about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I let them play. Okay. Because yep. again, yep. we're talking at, at at a lower level and and sort of younger riders. I really like to. It may be a simple exercise like turning a corner or you know going around a barrel or it, it can be with anything, mm-hmm. but. I really don't want to – I don't want my riders to do what I say because I said so. Yep. I want them to know in the gut that it's the right thing to do for them. So I'll give them, for, for a turning example, I might say trot up to, to the barrel, bring your inside hand sort of towards towards the midline or, or pull it back, lean towards the barrel and feel, see what happens, what sort of response do you get. And we'll, we'll talk about what sort of response you might have. And then I'll give them some more options about coming straight or opening the inside rein or holding the outside rein or we'll talk about it and I'll let them do that again and we might speed it up and slow it down. And as we're talking about it, I let them nut it through in their own mind as to mm-hmm. – and I'm, I'm giving them cues and, and I'm helping them, leading them towards the right yep, way. Yep, yep, But they children are so much better when they – work things out for themselves. It's it's a little bit like with your own children. You can say, be careful of that step. 
mm. you know, 10 times, but they're always going to go right up to that step until they fall off it. Yes. And they'll fall off it and they go, oh, wow, I've really got one. <laughs> we'll do that again. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, it's not that I want to set them up to fail, but it's, I, I also let it happen and let it be okay and, and let them learn through that through that process. If you can set it up so that it's in a safe environment, that's a lot better, though, than just, you know, having it in an environment where they're not going to be quite so safe. Yes, and I, and I set things up all the time. Uh, later on, we'll talk about tangible evidence, but yep. I really like to let with little guys exercises do the teaching because mm-hmm. they, they don't want to listen to me yelling at them the whole time. <laughs> it's so... They really can't process information quick enough. So I love to set an exercise, and certainly for those kids that are driven by challenge and they're driven by adventure and a bit of that fun, I really like to set up exercises and have them just play with it and process information in their own time. So I don't hurry them when they ask, and we'll talk about that in a minute, when they want to ask questions, I'm totally there for them. But I will, I'll often set things up to where they do make a little bit of a mistake, and it, like you said, in a very safe environment, but I'll also set them up to get it right. So I'll often chunk things where if they're not quite sure if they're getting things wrong, I'll chunk an exercise right back down, and I'll tell them and explain the process of how I'm chunking it back down. Mm-hmm. And I'll chunk right down to the simplest part to where I might find where they're going, oh, I had to a little heavier on this seat bone or I had to put my reins yes. towards yeah. 2 o'clock as opposed to back to 6 o'clock. And when we find that little aha moment, then I'll slowly chunk it back up, back to the exercise. But I might start with one exercise, but we'll end up doing four or five, you know, we'll go down a random path to four or five different exercises by chunking down to where I need to find where they're at. Yep. But then we go back to the exercise and then they see the whole process because I, I like to let them know the process as we go and I let them feel their way through it and sort of nut it out because then they remember it. Whereas if I just tell them stuff and certainly if I'm giving them lots of information, they'll only remember one or two things. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I let the exercise and I let them learn at their own pace. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now the next one, you know, there used to be a saying about children should be seen and not heard. And I think through, you know, the improvement in education systems and a more modern questioning type of a generation, we're we're talking now about children questioning everything. Would you like to talk about that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I often find that writers will interpret what we say very differently to how we've intended it. Mm-hmm. So I actually remember doing an exercise a couple of months ago. It was for a, a clinic that I was doing for instructors. And we were talking about this whole concept and I had sort of six writers there with me and I said to them, I sent them all out around the outside of an oval and gave them points to go. And I said, what I want you to do is just ride a big circle. Ride one big circle on your right rein, stop at the fence and then walk back. And the, the very range of circles I had, one went round the entire oval, one kid sort of went out two metres and turned around and came straight back, and, yeah. and their size of circles were completely different. And it was just a way of showing that we really need to get quite clear about what exactly we are saying. And when kids are getting lost or they're getting it wrong or they're not doing the right thing, I tend to first go hang on, have they understood my interpretation of what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And then we'll we'll talk about that. But I want them, if they're not sure, I want them to question. I want them to say, why? Why are we doing this? Yes. And I don't get offended in the slightest when they say that because all they're asking me is they want better clarification. Yep. So therefore, I have to work a little harder, which is is great for me. I love it when Mm -hmm. I have that challenge Mm -hmm. where... How else can I explain this? How else can I chunk this down? How else can I find that missing link and give them information in another way that they can understand? Because they're going to learn. There's going to be some kids that learn differently to how I learn. They might learn faster or slower, something that I learned. But I need to give the information to them how they're going to learn it. So I want them to question things. And and there, there have been times where I'm going, you know what? I'm going to find out more about that. And yep. I want them then to know that, hey, I don't know everything either. Yes. And I'll go and find some more information. And I actually really like those moments for them, for them to see me in that state of not knowing everything either. 
because they need to know that we don't know everything. And everything that I do know, I learned by making mistakes or I learned it from somebody. So it just, I didn't just, I weren't born knowing stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was yes. a process over time and I had to go and research and I had yep. to learn more and I had to do the hard yards to find out more. Okay. And I want them to know that they can do that too. Mm, 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 for sure, for sure. And the next one here is, um, again, you know, one that we didn't used to worry about, but the next one, this is, again, the changing generations, is the use of technology. Yes, and I'm using this more and more. Mm-hmm. And it does go back to that where you can't always just tell a child what to do or a writer what to do. Often they need to see it. So there's a million apps you can use, but for one example, I use an app called Technique. And I may do a, a short video for a few seconds or I might take a snapshot or this particular app, you can actually get two um, two videos. So let's say they're jumping a fence and you might jump it once and let them jump it their normal way when you, you might be describing how they're dropping their hips back or they're dropping their hands in front of the fence or whatever it may be. And then we'll talk about adjusting their position a little bit or adjusting something. We'll jump it the second time and if the second time obviously is an improvement sometimes we have to go a third or fourth time but then I'll put the two videos together and you can set it up so that it all happens at the same speed and at the same time and they can see the difference between the two and then they're actually when when they can see it it becomes It's up to them to make the change. It actually gives them a sense of responsibility and accountability because they can see it. It's not just my opinion. It's black and white in front of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I also, this great app, you can draw lines, you can draw squigglies on it, you can have a field day with it, you can speed it up and you can slow it down. So we'll quite often do a little exercise and we'll we'll talk about something and I'll video it and then we'll stop and we'll come back and, and we will, I'll draw lines and we will really just nut through it and let them ask the questions. And they, you can see them go, oh, my goodness, I really am leaning yes, one yes. shoulder off to one side. Or I can see what you mean about dropping the seat bone or collapsing in this rib. And when they see it, that's when they decide to make the change. <laughs> it's, it's actually yes. wonderful. I have so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. And now the next one, tangible evidence. What have you got to say about that? Yeah. (laughs) Well, I tend to go everywhere. There's pretty much always a set of little yellow cones Yes. And I've got this uh, two-inch poly pipe that's painted like a show jump, about two metres wide. Mm-hmm. And they pretty much go everywhere with me in the car. Because certainly with kids, I really find that when they can see a visual point to go to and they can see um, whether they've achieved something, it's, it's so, for example, riding parallel, we might often talk about sort of, um, for whatever reason, if we're leg yielding, trying to stay parallel to the yep, wall. Yep. But we might leg yield from one one of the poles to the other pole. And when they get to the pole, is it, are the shoulders leading or the quarters yes. leading? Or, yep. um, and it just, it really gives them such clear pictures. I might even, with the cones, just have them on a slight diagonal line. We might go one cone and then four to few steps and, and across to the next cone. But the more that they can actually see, even, for example, if I'm doing shoulder four or shoulder in, or I might just have some poles set up at certain angles, depending on the exercise, against the wall. So they can they can see the angle that they're, that they're wanting to come down the wall because often they're, you might talk about a shoulder four and they're sort of going 45, 60 degree angle trying to <laughs> yes. go there yes. And yep. you, you, you might ex- explain about the two or the three tracks, but sometimes they can't even get that concept. So I'll just put a rail. There's your angle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I can see it. And yes. then once they can see it, they're away. But I really do find the little guys just, they need something to see to go to. Yep, but yep. another one that I use that I, I quite like, and, and this one I always do in a controlled environment and, and in horses and riders that I know are quite safe, but we'll talk about having a really even circle. And they think that they're doing the quite even circle. Yeah. And I'll actually get a lunge lead and the handle part of the lunge lead, I'll just slip under their foot. So it's not connected in mm-hmm. any way, shape or form. They're just pressing on it. 
So if they, um, if anything happens, it, it just drops away so from the foot. It's mm. not connected at all. And the, the goal is to walk or trot, or if they ride out to it, they can canter. And if they get too far out on the circle, then the lunge lead just pops out from their foot and it drops. Yep. If they get too close to the inside of the circle, then the lunge lead touches the ground. Mm-hmm. So I'll say to them, your goal is to try to circle without the lunge lead touching the ground or popping out from your foot. And when they first do it, they're like snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, job. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and good one, you know. When they start- yeah, it's very tangible, and I can understand. Even a little competition, who can ride the best circle? Yep. Yeah, and mm. it's really hard. It's it's something that they think, oh, I can do this. This is really easy. <laughs> yes. Awesome, let's go. <laughs> yes. It can take four or five, six circles, and, and then they get into a rhythm, and they get into a flow, and they're consistently riding the shape. And they get so excited when they make a full circle, mm-hmm. and the rope stays just soft. <laughs> and I can give them a meter's grace or so by bringing my arm back and forth so I can sort of help them out there a little bit. But they generally get so excited and their circles improve out of sight. That's really good. That's a really good exercise, yeah. Yeah, and as you say, doing it safe so you're not going to put it under the rider's foot that with a horse that's going to worry about it and kick out or something or jump to the side if it falls. Um, Horses and riders, you know, it sounds like a really good exercise. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I've heard that one before, Annika, so it was really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm thinking the next one is give them homework. I'm thinking about homework for myself, and I've got instructor school next week, so I think I might. It's one I might be using with them as well. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so that's my that's my homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few different facets to this. It's what I tend to do whenever, and I, this is probably getting a little bit more to my slightly sort of more novice riders rather than beginners, mm. but I like to to label a session. So we might be working, whatever we're working on, I'll actually link a word to that. So, for example, um, we might use sweet and sour where we might be talking about how the concept of putting pressure on and taking the pressure off and we might work on that for, for half an hour okay. or we might talk about riding your three your 360 which is if you're jumping show jumping courses there's only for a 400 meter course there's only 40 meters of actual jumping if that there's 360 meters of corners and turns and canters and balance yep and so within a whole session for example we've done an hour working on riding nice turns, keeping them in front of the leg, all of that. But we're talking about the ride the 360. So if we then at the end of the session, your homework is practice riding your 360 mm-hmm. because I've chunked so much information into that word yes. or that sentence. It might be, um, for example, playing your best tennis where – I might talk about a rider and, and their mindset and how they tend to worry in the warm up and we might they may have spoken about a, a tennis game that they won last week and how we they were so relaxed in it and it was so much fun. So we'll sort of already link that fun tennis to the show jumping, we'll play some games to link that. And then mm-hmm. when they're going into the warm up, it might be play your best game of tennis. Yes. And because they've really linked that I don't have to give them lots of information and I don't need to overload them. I can just give them a sentence or a a word Mm. and that lesson comes back to them. So all that we've worked on is straight away brought back up to the conscious. Yes. And then they're already in that frame of mind of of where you were in that session. So I then get them to play with that at home. And the other thing I really do with the homework is I actually love to set up a warm-up routine and this is definitely for the horse's perspective where I like to have exercises that we know the horses do well, mm-hmm. we know that they're confident doing and that they're quite relaxed doing that exercise. And I get them to at home after they may have had a tough, uh, you know, quite a difficult task or they've done some hard work, finish off with a specific exercise where we keep linking for the horse that that means relax, that means settle, that means you've done well. And so when we're warming up in a competition, we've already got our warm-up routine, but we know that if the horse gets there and it gets anxious, great. We can go to this exercise because we've already linked it so well at home that this we know he can do it well, we know he's confident. And I, it still amazes me every time the horses go straight back to that relaxation once you put them into that exercise mm-hmm. because they yep. know it. Yep. And then once they're relaxed, then you can move back to – where you are on your warm-up. So I give them homework to really keep linking 
specific exercises with really confident states of well-being for the horse. So they, we can use that to our advantage when their emotion comes up or they get anxious at events. Yep, yep, no, very good. Now, the last one we're going to talk about is uh, analogies, metaphors and imagery. You know, and, and when would you use this? How would you use it? Just give us a bit more information about this oh, with children. I use this all the time. Okay. So I, admittedly, I have a bit of a, a creative got quite a weird sense of humour and, and if you've ever, ever sort of <laughs> most of my uh, students will attest to this I do things a little differently <laughs> but I love using metaphors and certainly with little kids and what I find is that the crazier the funnier the weirder you can actually make a metaphor the, the better the link you can make it so I'll give a random example um, of kids leaning when they're turning corners so we'll talk about, all right, imagine that you're sitting on a merry-go-round. You've got the pole coming through the top of your head, down through your spine, down through your horse into the ground. And so first I've got that, that picture of the merry-go-round and how it's upright. But then I'll laugh and I'm like, and if you lean too much too far to the side, the whole merry-go-round's going to fall down, the music's going to sound all crappy, the kid's going to start screaming. And <laughs> we'll, we'll get a bit crazy and funny about it. But they, because the emotion came up and they laughed, they really do start to to actually remember to stay tall. And as soon as we're coming around the corner, I might, might yell out, merry-go-round, and you can usually yes. see them laugh, but they sit up yes, because they I imagine remember. the merry-go-round. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. But I'll talk about um, when we're talking about impulsion and sort of creating that energy sort of into, into a soft hand, and we might talk about waves of water of, of when a wave comes in and if it's allowed to then travel, how the, the wave will continue on, whereas if it hits a, a brick wall or if it hits the breakwater, then the wave either splashes up and goes up, so for a mm-hmm. rear or whatever, yep. or it sort of tends to go back down under the water and suck back, which is when the horse sort of overbends and then gets on the forehand and sort of sucks back behind your leg. So I might use some of those examples, or we might talk about a contact and we'll say, well, imagine you're dancing with someone. Do you want to dance with like this wet fish who can't hold you and it's all over <laughs> the place? Or do you want to to have someone that, that moves with you and you're dancing with them? Or do you want to have someone that's just set and solid and... And we'll, we'll laugh about that or we might talk about uh, putting a leg on and, and what does a leg mean is whenever – and I always sort of say whenever you, you put your leg on or you put an aid on, you're always looking for a response and mm-hmm. you need to make sure you're consistent until you get that response and you might take your leg off or whatever that may be. Because the other thing I say is we don't have the right to, to influence a horse until we're in rhythm with it. Yes. And so for the, the example of once you're in rhythm and, and putting your leg on, we might say, well, you, you, the horse might be running along a fence, for example, but you turn that electric fence on and the horse is going to move off your leg quite quickly. Yes. So yep. sort of that analogy of, oh, I actually need to move off the fence mm-hmm. is another another funny way that we can use this. But another way, for example, at, at Pony Club where you've got, you might have 10 or 12 riders and you're consistently saying, two horse lengths, two horse or one horse length and, and there's, they keep running up against each other. I'll often stop and pull them up and I'll get them to create an imaginary bubble around them. And mm-hmm. I might even run a circle around one rider and give them a concept of the shape of the bubble. And then I'll say, what colour is your bubble? Is it pink with sparkles? And, and we'll quickly have a bit of fun yep. describing yep. the bubble. Yep. And then when we put them back on the circle, like, everyone's got their own bubble. And what's going to happen if you run into it? You're going to bounce off it and crash and we'll have a laugh about it. Uh-huh. But then you hear the kids going, oh, I can see your bubble. And instantly yes. they're, they're yes. keeping this two-horse space. Yes. And I don't even hear about the true horses, they just hilariously the laughing bubble. at the, the bubble in front yep. of them. Or, and for little guys, they love it when you can really get quite creative with it. But the, the other thing that I'll talk about with the imagery, and this one I, I find is really important, and I think it kind of rounds up a bit of everything. And regarding to the visualisation, I'll often, if I've got an exercise where I might have four or five fences in mm-hmm. a row, a couple of changes, leads or whatever, yep. and I'll get them to to imagine it, it going beautifully, you know, really imagine how you'd like it to be. And then I'll get them to, to talk me through it, tell me what's going to happen. And I listen very carefully to the language because often I'll hear, and after this fence, I'm going to change my canter leads. And I'll say, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're presupposing that you've already landed on the wrong lead. Mm, mm, oh, that's right. Well, yes. you land on the wrong lead. Aha, hang on, let's go back. Let's come back, all right, how are you going to set that up beforehand? And then, so we'll talk about that, and then we might, she might say, 
I'm going to jump my oxa and then I'm going to get him to come back or I'm going to ask him to wool. And I'm like, but that's already presupposing he's running on. And yes, so we'll, yes. I get very careful what they say mm, because mm. I've seen it over and over again for the riders that say, I'll land and change my can lead. They land on the wrong lead and then they change their can lead because they already have an expectation that that's going to happen. So subconsciously, they've created that to actually yes, happen. Yes. And when we come back and go, whoa, 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 all right, how are we going to set this up? Set this up and then we'll talk about it. All right, so I've made sure he's off my inside leg and I'm going to land. And when I land, I'm going to feel him come into my outside rein and then I'm going to feel that I've got the time to make the turn. And I get them to think about it and tell me through it again and then ride it again. And they, nine times out of ten, land on the correct lead. And I have so much fun with this, but I'm Mm -hmm. really careful around the language that they use when we're doing this this imagery. And I really do get them when they're visualising, certainly when we've walked a show jumping course before they compete, to get as much information as they can on that course. So when they're riding it, they're not thinking about so much about the course because they've already put it subconscious. So then they can start to feel the horse and start to create what they've already visualised and already imagined in their mind. And I've had to be very careful, have they imagined the right things? (laughs) Yes, yes. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Annika, I, I think that was good. You know, you've sort of given me a couple of exercises and I, I've been teaching kids <laughs> and, and teaching coaches to teach kids for quite a long time. Yep. And I'm sure you've given, you know, your your toolbox of ideas, I'm sure that you've given people lots of ideas to go on and, and this is the sort of um, chat that they're going to come back and go, now, what was that again? I just, I want to engage with these kids. I'll just go back and listen to that chat again and see what Annika's got to say because I might have written down some notes but missed a bit so I can see that they'll come back and play this again and again just to get those tips. So thank you. Thank you again for yeah. your time. Thanks for chatting to us. Looking forward to you coming back again. I, I think, um, yeah. you know, you, I'm sure you've got a toolbox full of lots and lots of things. <laughs> Well, I do, and what I'm actually going to do, if you're okay with this, after this, yeah. um, this is it's put up online, is I'm actually going to create an ebook that goes along with this podcast. Oh, perfect. So they can jump yep. onto my website and then download that ebook, and it'll have more specific exercises, and I'll really unpack a lot of this information okay, good, more. Good. So they can then go download that, and then they've got actual the evidence in front of them, they've got the the tools and and some games and things to do in front of them to really go on with because I just want to help as many people as I can and help some little kids and and I I just love it. So thank you so much for letting me um, put some of this out there. Yeah, look, and we'll put that link to your ebook on our page as well or on your page, which will be horsechats.com slash Annika Overton. Two, um, Annika's A double N Y K A or A N N Y K A, and then Overton O V E R T O N. Even if you go to horsechats.com and search for Overton, you'll get that. And um, we'll have uh, just go to the bottom of the page and the link to the ebook. As soon as Annika sends it over to us, we'll put that link on, and um, you'll be able to go directly to her site then and, and download that ebook, which would be great. Okay, so what thank you. Thank you so much, Glenis. <laughs> Look, I'm looking forward to catching up with you again. I'm sure you've got a toolbox of ideas. I'd like to talk to you about 10 steps to achieve the correct rising trot. I'm sure that instructors will learn a lot about that. I know you've only got seven, but I'm sure if you do three preparation steps, that'll keep us in line with our with our 10 <laughs> tips, 10 strategies, 10 steps. So I'm sure you'll be able to work it out. Sure thing. Okay. Good yep, to talk to you, sure. Annika. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, you too. Bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses, or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 